Hi. So today we are going to take a little break from behaviorism and talk about student differences. Um, specifically, we'll talk a little bit about intelligence and gender bias in this lecture today. So let's get started. So we'll start off with intelligence. And um, so my background is gifted education. So I um, have studied a lot about intelligence. So I'm going to bring a little bit of that expertise to this lecture today. So first off, what is intelligence? It's one of those words we use all the time. But what do we mean when we say intelligence? Um, I like to use this definition comes straight from the dictionary. It's the ability to acquire and apply knowledge and skills. Um, so strictly thinking about um, knowledge and skills and how do we learn. So it's like intelligence is like, how good are we at learning and using those things that we learn? So the first question is really, is intelligence learned or innate? And again, if I just talk to common lay people, I might get different answers to that, right? Um, that I might get people who would say, oh yeah, you can definitely become more intelligent, that I could teach you to become more intelligent, or um, other people who would say it's, it's something that you're born with. Um, however, if I talk to researchers who are talking about the theoretical construct of intelligence and IQ, it's really something that most people, most researchers and experts in the field consider to be something that's pretty innate, something that you're kind of born with or born with the capacity to reach. Um, is it stable over time or does it grow? Now, obviously, it grows over time in the sense that as a um, that your ability to apply knowledge and skills gets better, that your um, that as a baby, you don't know very much and your ability to apply what you know um, is limited. And as you get older, you get better at that. However, your intelligence in relations to others doesn't really change. So that your, your IQ, your relative intelligence at five is relatively stable um, compared to your intelligence at 18 or at 20. So while you may be able to think better and apply things better at the age of 20 than you were at the age of five, your relative intelligence compared to other five-year-olds or other 18-year-olds hasn't really changed over time. Therefore, we mostly consider intelligence to be stable over time. And finally, the question of can we measure it? Well, certainly we have scales and we have tests and instruments that measure intelligence. That's really important to keep in mind that those scales and measurements do so imperfectly. So we have this theoretical construct that we call intelligence, this thing about our ability to acquire knowledge and apply skills, but that doesn't mean that we can measure it very well. It doesn't mean that we know exactly what any given person's intelligence is based upon a measurement that we can take. So a little bit about the history. How do we get to intelligence? How did this become a construct that we that we use, that we find useful, or that we even care about in schools or in our in our lives? So um, it kind of began with army alpha testing. So going into World War II, the army wanted a way we were recruiting and um, drafting lots of men into the army. And we really wanted a way to be able to distinguish men that would be eligible or would be capable of um, commanding or being um, in an officer's role. So we start off with this army alpha testing that was really meant to be a way to measure capacity for thinking that um, could theoretically um, divide men into those that could be capable of becoming officers or not. And, and we still have a version of this kind of testing today, although it's gone through many, many revisions. But this is one of the reasons why we first started thinking about why it might be important to measure this construct, whatever it is. And then that leads us to Alfred Binet. Um, in 1904, he developed the um, Binet scales um, in Paris, and he was really trying to come up with a measure to distinguish which children would benefit from schooling. So really thinking about who, would, who could be schooled. Um, and if we think about um, in the 1900s, we're, we're starting reform efforts, we're starting compulsory schooling, and it, it really is on the edge of whether or not we should be educating everyone. So really thinking about who's going to benefit, who can learn. So this intelligence is this idea of who can learn. Um, and then Lewis Terman took, he was working at Stanford, and he took the Binet test and um, adapted it for English. So we come up with the Stanford Binet test, which is still one of the major intelligence testing tests that we have um, in schools today. 
um, he really changed the meaning of IQ and that intelligence quotient to mean a mental age divided by the chronological age. Now that definition has changed since then. Um, and really thinking about um, intelligence in terms of school success, which is really where the history of intelligence testing has come from. And he used this intelligence test, he developed it, and he used it to, um, to do a lot of longitudinal studies. In fact, one of the studies is the term, the term in studies is this longitudinal study looking at, um, at the, the, top, the top scores on his test um, over time. And really, this was fundamental and foundational to the study of gifted education which is why I, I put it on here, um, we, he really was one of the first people to find that, that smart people weren't um, you know, um, less able or, or feeble. Um, there was this myth that gifted kids um, were less strong or might be more prone to sickness. And really, Terman kind of showed that they, they were actually pretty successful in life um, and that there wasn't anything um, wrong with gifted, with really smart people. Um, and, and we only found that out through doing the study. Now, there were some problems with this early intelligence testing. It was based upon some of some eugenics movements and, and this idea of trying to separate people by their intelligence, um, thinking in terms of race. And um, that's really, really problematic and nothing that any current researcher would endorse. And this idea that we believe that intelligence or we know that intelligence is equally distributed across race, across um, ethnicities, across cultures, um, and that, um, that, that, yeah, that this capability of learning and achieving doesn't have anything to do with, um, with race. So there's some major groupings of intelligence testing now, and we start off with these traditional intelligence testing. So the Stanford Binet we just talked about, and the WISC or the Wexler Intelligence Tales Scales for Children. There's also a Scales for Adults and a Scale for Younger Children, um, Infant or um, Toddlers. And um, these tests are given one on one by trained psychologists. They measure working memory, digit spans, um, things like. Um, really traditional tests. They're pretty much considered the gold star of intelligence testing if, if we're going to give IQ testing a, um, a format. Um, and um, and they, they give a they give a what we might consider a measure that's valid across um, exceptionalities and those types of things. Um, we also have a group of intelligence testing that are group administered. So they're given with paper and pencil to a whole group of kids at once. Um, those include things like the COGAT, which is a cognitive abilities test, or the Otis Lennon. And you might have heard of either of these tests. Um, these tests are, um, are a little less accurate for kids who have any kind of exceptionality. So if I have dyslexia, for example, I'm going to have a harder time with a paper pencil test. Um, or if I have ADHD or if I have an attentional disorder, right? Um, so they're a little less accurate, um, although for typically developing students um, with, no, um, with no exceptionalities, they have a really high correlation with the traditional Stanford Binet and, or WESC, uh, WESC test, and they are, um, they're a lot less expensive to give because I can give them to a whole bunch of kids at once. And finally, there's nonverbal IQ tests, um, something like the Raven's Progressive Matrices or the Maglieri Nonverbal Abilities Test. And these tests don't rely on language at all. So you can see an example here on the left of a problem where you would, you would have to find the pattern recognition. So these nonverbal tests are really interesting because um, theoretically they should um, eliminate a lot of bias that might be inherent in some other IQ tests that depend on language. So English language learners are people from um, non-majority cultures um, might be, the test might be biased against and they might not do as well and theoretically a nonverbal test would eliminate these. So the problem with nonverbal tests is they don't really correlate too much. So while they can tell us, you know, pattern recognition and spatial reasoning skills, they don't necessarily tell us about thinking and processing skills in the way that we'd like to see a correlation with achievement perhaps. Okay. So some problems concerning intelligence testing. So um, what, what do we see as some issues with this? Well, the first one is validity. And really the issue is um, we can't measure intelligence perfectly. Well, we can measure nothing perfectly and intelligence is particularly tricky to measure. So when we get this score, we tend to want to think that it's this, this is my intelligence. I have a 130 IQ. But really and truly, we just aren't very sure about the accuracy of that measurement. 
um, and it partly depends on how we define that construct. So because we don't have a well-defined construct, we don't really know exactly what intelligence means. We have a hard time measuring it with a lot of validity. Um, so another question is, does intelligence mean school ability? And certainly in the beginning of our definitions of intelligence, we were equating those two, that intelligence as a useful construct was school ability or the ability to achieve and learn and do these kind of classroom type tasks. However, um, as a useful construct is, um, is a more practical view of intelligence may be more useful for life. And then the last question is, there's been some really interesting research showing that, you know, with some intensive training that we can actually improve people's IQ scores, um, their scores on the test. So um, this question of can we improve IQ by doing these things? And the question would really be, um, is that a problem? Does this tell us that IQ can, can grow and learn and we can get better at it? Or does this tell us that our measurement of IQ is wrong? And that's really a theoretical question that you would have to answer for yourself. Is this a problem with how we measure it? So does the fact that we can get better on the measurement mean that our test is flawed? Or does it really mean that maybe perhaps intelligence is something that can learn and grow over time? And then finally, we do see um, differences in test scores um, that um, across gender or, and across race at times. And then that question is, are these tests biased? So is there a problem with the test itself? in that um, as a language bias against cultural or ethnic groups? Um, or is it a problem with society that perhaps we're not giving um, children these early opportunities to do well on these tests um, in, a in a training type situation? Um, are we just more acculturated some groups of people to doing well on these types of tests than others? Um, or is our whole system flawed in relying upon IQ tests or intelligence testing for any kind of measurement? And these are really the questions that kind of swirl around in our heads as we think about intelligence testing. There's also some other models of intelligence that are mentioned in the book, and I, I wanted to go over these quickly just so you had some familiarity. Um, the Wexler Global Capacity View really thinks about viewing intelligence outside of school environments. So thinking about intelligence, um, not just in school related ways, but um, in our ways outside of school and in, in life. And the question is, is why are we using IQ and what is our purpose for intelligence? And is this a useful construct for us to try to measure? Um, Sternberg's triarchic view really thinks about this global capacity view perhaps and breaks it down to three distinct areas. So he talks about the analytic intelligence, which is really probably what's measured by IQ tests. The creative intelligence, which is our, our ability to, to change um, and synthesize and come up with new and different ideas than other people's ideas. And then practical intelligence is, is our ability to take these ideas and put them to use in the real world. And the idea to be successful in life takes practical intelligence. And, and maybe this, um, this triarchic view um, allows us to um, celebrate and to recognize other types of intelligence that aren't measured on these tests. Things like um, people who can survive on the streets or people who can, um, who can um, create a business that, um, that lasts. And then like Bill Gates has a lot of practical intelligence in addition to his analytic intelligence, right? He's able to take his company and make it highly successful, right? Um, and the question really is then again, why would we need to use this triarchic view? And I'll say that of, of the three that we're talking about here, Sternberg's um, approach has the most research to support it. There's really, really has done some work to to show that there's some empirical evidence behind these three. And in fact, he's used his triarchic view um, in a couple of universities as part of their admissions process to try to capture a more diverse group of students by looking at both practical, creative, and analytic intelligences um, in his admissions process, which I think is actually maybe something interesting and something to consider. And then finally, Gardner's um, multiple intelligences view. And the only reason I'm mentioning this is because um, you're inevitably going to hear about it in some of your classes. And you know, he's 
they list eight in the book. I think that there might be nine or 10 now that he, he keeps coming up with more intelligences. And I, I want to say that I think it's interesting to perhaps think about the different ways in which um, students might have talents or the different ways in which we might express these talents. Um, but I wouldn't go as far as to say that they're intelligences, particularly since there's no empirical support for Gardner's theories that he really, there really isn't any way that we could show that these are distinct constructs or um, useful in a way that would be practical for the classroom. So I would really stay away from the multiple intelligences view, except to maybe think about the ways and of course celebrate the different strengths of students, which we can do in other ways without having this framework of theories. So I would ignore multiple intelligences, but if you're looking for ways to think about intelligences outside of the traditional IQ, you might think about the triarchic view. Um, learning styles, um, I'm just going to say that you can skip this section of the textbook. Remember that there's really no empirical support for learning styles. It's differences between students that really we know learning um, is kind of universal, that all kids really learn, and that um, we all learn best when we learn, when we're given opportunities to learn through multiple modalities and multiple ways. Um, and the exceptions would be obviously if I am deaf or hard of hearing, um, you know, an auditory presentation is not going to help me if I have an auditory processing disorder or if I have a, a diagnosed disability, then um, then obviously that's not going to be a style of learning that's open to me. But for most students, um, using lots of different ways to get the material across is the absolute best way. Um, so now you're smarter than the textbook. So give yourself a pat on the back. OK, let's um, switch roles here and talk a little bit about gender differences and gender biases, which is also covered in the textbook in this chapter. So I want to talk a little bit first. Um, the book doesn't discuss this, but I think it's important to know, especially as um, our world is um, getting to greater understandings about gender and sex, that the gender is presented in the textbook as a binary thing, but I want to point out to you that gender isn't a binary thing, that, that people fall um, within a huge spectrum on gender, um, that they may be more or less um, expression of that gender, more a gender, more masculine or more feminine, um, or both, um, that they, that their biological sex may or may not match their gender identity, which is how they, how they view themselves, um, and also their gender expression, um, which is how they express themselves to the outside world, and that that is also separate from who they are attracted to. So I just want to point that out and say that that while this this rest of this presentation really presents gender as perhaps more of a binary, that this isn't necessarily true, and that I want you to be aware of that in your classrooms and for your students. Okay, so observe gender differences um, in scores. Um, we know that boys outscore girls um, in general. Um, lots of studies have supported this um, in visual spatial abilities. So there's kind of nonverbal intelligence tests. Um, college entrance exams. So we have lots of support for things like the SAT and the ACT that the, the boys tend to outscore girls. Um, and then when we ask boys, are you good at English language arts? Are you good at math? Are you good at science? Boys tend to have really high self-efficacy, really high self-concept there as compared to girls. So girls tend to outscore boys on tasks of memory. So um, things like um, working memory, repeating numbers back, those kinds of things. They tend to outscore boys um, in language use and language exams. But they, um, and they tend to have higher grades or achievement than boys, but they have lower self-efficacy or self-concept. So even when they score higher than boys, even in subjects like math and science, um, they tend to still judge themselves as worse at it. So what does this mean? I think the real question here um, is nature versus nurture. So there's two ways we could interpret this. One would be that boys' brains are different than girls' brains. And you know, there's maybe some evidence that shows that, um, that if we look at male and female brains in adulthood, that they are different. Um, but we would want to know why. And we know that brains are malleable. So the pathways that you use in the brain become stronger over time. So if we ask boys, let's say boys, um, young boys, to do things like build with Legos, and we ask girls to do things like, you know, play with dolls and talk to their dolls, it makes sense that boys might, you know, in general, be better at building and, 
and um, manipulating visual spatial things and, and girls might be better at, at talking and using language, right? So we have this systemic um, society in which we have nurtured boys and girls to have differential strengths um, on these tests. And that's, that's one explanation for these differences. Um, it also might be due to how we assess and grade these um, um, these on a personal level um, with with our grading and how the ways in which we talk to boys and girls. So um, I don't want to go go and say that these are strict biological differences, but that they might have to do with our society in general. So gender bias. So how do we where where do we experience or where is their gender bias? So the first one is there's been lots of studies that show that teachers are more likely to listen to boys answers than girls answers in class and to respond more positively to them. And um, that's something that we might do subliminally or subconsciously and not on purpose, but it's something to keep in mind as you interact with your students. Um, we also show socialize students differently and children differently. And we, I just mentioned that with um, even in early childhood asking, you know, what kinds of toys we buy for, for girls versus boys or, or what we, um, the types of activities that we encourage um, teenagers to um, interact with, right? Um, the role models that um, you might have um, is more likely that you might have, um, you know, males in science fields and females um, in the social sciences, for example, or um, who you might see as people on TV that you want to emulate. Um, and then there's also, of course, um, issues of violence and safety that um, are different for women and men in the workplace and, and in society. Um, and we have tacit and explicit communication about this. So we explicitly sometimes say, oh, no, that is a boy's toy and that is a girl's toy. Um, but more often, these things are more tacit. These are just the way things are done, and we don't necessarily explicitly say it, but it's more of a socialization. So these, this is part of our society, um, and how do we overcome it? So what are the effects of this? Um, we know that early on, um, from middle school on, that there are differences in the courses that girls choose to sign up for versus boys, um, and that pathway into math and science that we call STEM pipeline. There's lots of research showing that, um, for example, that girls are much less likely to start on that STEM pipeline, start in those early math classes, and they're much more likely to exit that pipeline and continue on to a career in math and science. Um, so we know that there's an effect um, in career choice um, across, um, across the country, that we know that there are an overrepresentation of females in, let's say, elementary education and nursing, and an underrepresentation of females in careers like um, uh, chemical engineers, engineering, um, computer science. Um, we also know that there's a differential effect of classroom class participation. The boys are much more likely to participate in most classes. Um, and so our question for us as teachers is what can we do? Are there ways in which we can organize and, um, and encourage class participation, encourage course and career choices for our female students or for our male students um, to change these gender biases? So um, just some questions for you to think about in this lecture. And if you have any questions, please um, talk to me. I'm happy to answer emails um, or set up a meeting to talk to you. Bye.